Welcome to Arca Treats Food for Thought, sponsored by Friends of the Alabama Archives. I'd like to remind everyone to turn off your cell phones or silence your cell phones, please, before the program begins. And remember that the Archives is open on the second Saturday of each month. We began last Saturday with our opening on, a special opening on Saturdays, and we had many visitors and many researchers come to the research room. We invite you to plan now to attend Architreats next month on December 16th. Greg Wasselkopf will present the Coming Up the Creek War as part of the statewide Becoming Alabama commemoration. Today's speaker earned a bachelor's and master's degree from Alabama State University. He earned a doctorate degree in American history from the University of Akron, then moved on to Savannah, Georgia to further his career as assistant professor and museum curator. He returned to Alabama State University in 2004, where he now serves as the ASU archivist and teaches history. Early in his career, he worked here at the Alabama Department of Archives and History, and we welcome him back. Please welcome Dr. Ed Howard Robinson. And it is good to be back. I, I feel at home of sorts. Um, thank you for coming out. Um, I wanted to talk today about black business development in Montgomery, Alabama, but more specifically, the rationale for black business development in that um, this development or this approach to entrepreneurialism and black business as a, a social outlet and, and an avenue towards um, economic um, empowerment and, and, and as an avenue towards realizing the American dream was not something that was um, without without effort or without forethought. And I want to, I want to couch my discussion in this. Um, at the turn of the century, you have uh, <clears throat> African Americans, particularly Booker T. Washington, emerge as a national leader. Now, Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington cut his teeth, or really um, landed on the national scene in 1896 with an exposition speech in Atlanta, Georgia, where he gained some notoriety for what came to be known as his accommodationalist approach. He, he urges black folks to, to um, cast down their bucket where they are. In essence, he was telling black people to make the best of the environment, make the best of, of the agricultural um, activities that they were involved in, make the best of the business and economic opportunities that were available to them. But he also was saying a variety of other things. One, he was, he was urging African Americans to jettison or to forego political inclusion. Now, Booker T. Washington was astute in that he observed what was happening nationally in terms of um, the ending of Reconstruction and uh, growing hostility towards black participation in the political process. And he advocated it. He also advocated social subordination and social segregation. Again, he read what was happening already or anyway in the um, political and social life of the nation. And so, again, advocated it. And so by advocating black folks or black people to forego political inclusion, um, to, to restrain from pursuing social integration and social equality, um, Booker T. Washington organized, well, conceptualized this idea of accommodationalism. Now, it wasn't Booker T. Washington's brainchild. He had been um, influenced by the thinkers of his day. And he had been influenced by the realities of his day. So he took a very practical approach. Okay, in taking that approach, Booker T. Washington wanted to focus significant energies and, uh, and efforts in economic development. And so part of that idea comes to fruition in the creation of the National Negro Business League. So in August of 1900, Booker T. Washington calls together some 400 professional and black um, leaders from around the nation and business persons from around the nation to coordinate and to talk about and to promote this idea of economic development as the focal point of black empowerment. Okay. 
what comes out of this is, again, the, the creation of the National Negro Business League. And it, 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 members of the business community in Montgomery, Alabama, attend this inaugural meeting and become instrumental in this organization. Uh, Victor Hugo Tulane, and some of you may know of his monuments that still exist in Montgomery, Tulane Court, um, to name one. But Victor Hugo Tulane had come to Montgomery from Prattville and, and, and had built a, a grocery business. He established or had a, had a particular blend of coffee called Tulane's Pride and had it patented. Um, he built a, a, a grocery store on the corner of Ripley and High Street, and he became an important local business figure in his own right. He eventually rises to the level of treasurer in the National Negro Business League, heads up the Alabama branch of the National Negro Business League, and becomes a confidant and a conduit for Booker T. Washington and his ideas in Montgomery, Alabama. Booker T. Washington um, <clears throat> visits Montgomery, Alabama. In 1909, there's a record of his visit to um, Montgomery's old ship, Amy Zion Church. And in that church session, he speaks to a, a, congregate, a group of African-American men. It's a men-only session. And he chastises the men in that, in that group. The Tuskegee educator accentuated this idea of self-help and this message of self-help employing black men in the city of Montgomery to stop calling attention to their disadvantage and trouble, while, according to Washington, they further handicap themselves by overlooking their, advantage or their advantages and their opportunities to succeed. So Booker T. Washington, this is sort of part and parcel of the rhetoric that Booker T. Washington um, espoused as part of his accommodationalist approach. So it stands the reason with this, with this philosophy that, that, that is undergirded by this idea of business acumen that Booker T. Washington would create something like the, the, the National Negro Business League. But what, what's interesting about the creation of this business league is that it's really the brainchild of W.E.B. Du Bois. W.E.B. Du Bois, um, one second. Can, can, I, I can't see the image on this screen here. Okay. okay. So, <clears throat> and I'll let them fix that while I talk. <laughs> um, one, one, um, the, the, the conference of, on, on the study of Negro problems that was held at Atlanta University, and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois is a professor at Atlanta University at the time, and he's held a, he holds a series of conferences. The first one starting in 1896. But in 1899, he held a conference, and the, the focus of this conference dealt with um, Negro business. In fact, the name of, was called the Negro in Business. And he looks at the 1890 census to get some assessment of the, the state of African American business, not only um, locally, but nationally. And so he's making a, a sociological study, or executing a sociological study um, looking at black business throughout the nation and the state of black business. He says a variety of things about black business. But um, <clears throat> one of the more important things that he says is that, um, is that black businesses are cropping up throughout the nation and addressing the needs of African Americans without much coordination. And he, um, he suggests that there needs to be some organization that can coordinate the efforts of black business development in Montgomery. He suggests that, that there was a value in, 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 in black business development and that black business development would take hard work, thrift, com comprehension of social movements, and the ability to learn new vocations and new vocational skills. All of this would take place, according to Du Bois, um, through concerted and guided action. Okay. So Du Bois was <clears throat> looking at the black business development advocating that it's development, and he was calling for some organization to, um, to help coordinate black business men and help them focus on modern, at the time, um, modern approaches to business development, to look to be forward-looking. Now, he's also critical of, the, of, of black business development, and he, he, he creates three classifications. One he would call the trader class, and he would suggest that this is the most, the, the largest element of black business persons would be those grocers, small grocers, cook shops. They were, um, 
they would have less than $500 of invested capital, and um, they would be the, most, the more fluid business persons in that they would go in and out of business um, regularly. He established another classification called businessmen or business persons, and they would have over $500 worth of invested stock. And he had a variety of individuals, bar so some barbers, um, some other grocery stores and, and dry goods stores, would, would, persons would fit into that category. And then he had a, a capitalistic class, a capital class. Um, those with $1,500 or more of invested capital. And you could see this dichotomy play out in Montgomery uh, amongst the black business class in the city of, of Montgomery. <clears throat> now, W.E.B. Du Bois also identifies a number of different institutions, and I would call the black press an institution, as critical to black business development in Montgomery, I mean, in, in, in the United States, in that W.E.B. Du Bois saw black businesses as a, 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 a social force on the precipice of making a significant impact in, in the nation. And that African American families were familiar with the black press, and while it did not change or, or, or set the agenda in black community, it did reflect to a great degree the ideas and the aspirations of black people. And he, 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 he really is advocating for um, the inf a greater emphasis on the black press and greater coordination amongst black newspaper editors. And so he sees this as an important or critical um, development in the self-empowerment or the uh, uh, improvement of black folks. Okay. Um, in Montgomery, the, Rev uh, the minister for the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, Reverend R.C. Judkins, was, a, was an important figure and an ally of Booker T. Washington, and his newspaper was part of the orbit of Booker T. Washington's National Business League. And again, in the National Negro Business League, there are, there are a number of sort of subsidiary or, um, or sub-organizations. So you have a National Negro Bankers Association, a National Negro Funeral Directors Association, a Negro, National Negro Press Association. So you had these various sub-organizations that spoke to uh, you know, a variety of different um, black business pursuits or economic pursuits. And the, but the black newspaper was critical. It was critical in that it, it forwarded or, or promoted the, the propaganda and the dogma, the ideology of the National Negro Business League and this emphasis on business development. So in Montgomery, you see this emphasis through um, Judkins' Colored Alabamian um, imploring African Americans to buy, black, buy from black businesses, imploring African Americans to support black institutions. And, and this, is, uh, this is sort of a prolific um, um, rhetoric that, that comes from the, the black press. Now there are several elements to um, this, this promotion of the black business class. One of the elements is, comes in the form of um, black banking. And so <clears throat> African Americans cut their teeth in terms of black banking on the, the Freedman Savings and Loan Company established in 1865, signed into law um, by um, the act, enabling act is signed by Abraham Lincoln before he passes away. And in, in 1870, five years after it opens in 1865, there's a branch open in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, it advertises that it will provide monies for mortgages, it will provide monies for startup businesses, and it, it really speaks to the aspirations of African Americans to join the, the full and the mainstream um, economic life of the nation. And so, by, from 1865 to 1871, 71,000 African American depositors around the nation deposited um, $56 million in 34 branches. Okay. In 1873, there's an economic recession. Some would describe it as a depression. And there's a run on the bank. In 1874, the Montgomery branch and the, the Freeman Savings Bank goes under. Thousands lose their money. 2,955 black depositors in Montgomery, Alabama lose their savings. It 
sends shockwaves through black community and sours them to the idea of blanking, banking for another generation. So this, this concept of black business empowerment and the part of that concept that has to do with black banking has a significant hurdle to overcome at the turn of the century. In 1890, um, <clears throat> a gentleman, the Reverend W.R. Pettiford in Birmingham, Alabama, organizes the Penny's, Penny Savings Bank. And what's imp important about this bank is that it has to, again, overcome this idea of this, this fear of banking um, stemming from the, free, the failure of the Freedman Savings Bank. But it does this, and it, it takes this pro the approach that it's going to use the black newspaper to do this. And so there's this symbiotic relationship between the, this banking interest and the black newspaper and the back, black business class and the National Negro Business League. And so what you see is in 1893, the, 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 the bank is incorporated, and by 1910, you have branches in a variety of cities in Alabama, Birmingham, Selma, Anniston, okay? 1910, you have the bank branch open in Montgomery. And the bank um, utilizes the, the black business class and, and really the, the, the creme de la creme of the black business class in Montgomery to sit on its board to head up this bank in order to overcome the opposition and fear of blank banking amongst the black community. So you have Nathan Alexander, who is a, a noted um, um, entrepreneur in, in, in Montgomery and, and, a, and a respected businessman, head up the bank as his president. Victor Hugo Tulane, again, um, a noted businessman, the, the only African American who was actually um, um, allowed to sit with the white only chamber of commerce because of his big business acumen is the branch tre um, cashier. Um, physicians, Dr. Um, D.H. Scott and um, Alfred Dungy, another physician, black physician, also sit on the branch. Both of these individuals are going to make um, speeches and are going to be integral parts of the National Negro Business League and again are going to forward this, uh, this philosophy of business acumen. Um, um, <clears throat> Henry Allen Loveless who was a noted um, he, was a, he had a variety of occupations but he, he owned a stall, a meat stall in the city market he was a hack operator and had a, 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 a whole a fleet of um, vehicles that were horse-drawn that delivered produce throughout the, the, the city. Um, he, oper he, he was a builder. Um, so Henry Allen loved, let's say he was a, a, a mortician, he owned, owned a funeral home. He had a number of occu um, occupations and business interests and probably was the most wealthiest African-American in Montgomery. Elijah Cook, who was uh, the first black um, mortician or funeral director in, in, the, in Montgomery after the Civil War. John H. Fagan, who was a harness maker. Um, George Neustell, a dry goods um, operator. So the, the, the board of directors of the Penny Savings Bank branch in Montgomery was read like a who's who in black business. But the, all of these individuals were also affiliated with the National Negro Business League. Um, the Penny Savings Bank really was part of this propaganda machine. And it advocated that in order to, for, for African Americans to buy real estate and to, to uh, afford homes and property, um, for them to realize a profit on their monies, um, that they needed to participate and actually um, invest in the, the, this, the penny savings bank. Um, the bank said it was affordable to even the most humble persons and would accept um, deposits of one dollar with a determination that you would add to it over time. Um, one, um, one typical day reported the, uh, um, the colored Alabamian 257 customers deposited over $7,000. The bank would try to be very transparent and publish in the newspaper its financial transactions and its, and its, and its balance sheet. 
So by, by, by trying to be transparent and by um, in utilizing the most respected black business person, persons in the city, it gained a degree of acceptance in black community. But it also advocated a, a, what they call the three essentials of race elevation, intelligence. And it, it pointed to the development of educational institutions throughout the, the region and the country dedicated to, to, to educating African Americans. Character, and it pointed to the black church as the major institution developing character amongst the, of the black population. And money, and again it pointed to itself the black banking system, and the black business class. But also, Pettiford, um, the black president, articulated this accommodationist ideology in other ways. Um, there's one uh, edition of the Colored Alabamian um, published in 1909 where he talks about, where he describes his position as it relates to white Montgomery. He says, or white persons, in, in, in this case, it would, uh, it would be Birmingham. While we don't complain, quote, while we don't complain of separation, for the intelligent and self-respecting Negro desires to maintain the identity of race, at the same time, taking all of the means of civilization that have been so effective in the elevation of the white race, I am glad to note, while we cannot receive assistance by intermingling amongst whites, some of them are inclined to help us maintain the expenses of, our, of building a higher civilization among us. This is typical Booker T. Washington accommodationalism, acquiescing to white supremacy and asking for um, support in economic development, placing economic development at the, at the top of um, the list of priorities. Another component of, of, this, of this ideology and this approach is, the, is selling black people and the black population on the efficacy of banking. And so you see the same type of ideology um, reflected in the newspapers, and it's not just the colored Alabama, and there's about three or four black newspapers during this, this 25 um, year time period that I cover in this, in this study. And, and, and they're all saying virtually the same thing. Um, <clears throat> in, order to, in, in order to influence and encourage black pop, the black population, to embrace not only business and, and, and banking um, investment, but also invest in, in, in insurance, the Colored Alabamian articulates the, the, uh, the Afro-American life insurance's um, idea that, that there's this nationalistic element to black business. And when I say nationalistic, I mean that, that there's this, there's this almost this, this move towards this creation of a separate and semi-autonomous black world. And in that black world, black insurance companies employ black um, 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 attorneys to write policies or, or underwriters, employ black doctors to examine applicants for policies, employ black lawyers to examine the title of property and, and title of and applications for loans, and, and utilize and employ black banks to deposit their, their income. And so the black insurance company becomes important. Now, W.E.B. Du Bois is, is a bit critical and a bit more sober about the, um, the importance and the magnitude of black businesses, particularly black insurance companies. And he points out several things about these black insurance companies. One, he says that they, they, they're dwarfed when compared to their white counterparts. And, um, and that African-American insurance policies only make up about a quarter of the insurance policies written um, to benefit black people in the United States. So black African-American insurance companies only control, or only maintain a small portion of those, those, those um, policies. And that uh, the insurance, black insurance companies conduct a survey at the time and find out that black people prefer white insurance companies and think that they are more stable. So there's this um, perception to overcome, or this perception of inferiority to overcome. Booker T. Washington points out, I mean, excuse me, W.E.B. Du Bois points out that in 1923, the white-owned Metropolitan Life Company, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, held almost $7 million of insurance on African Americans. That is about twice as much as the $3.5 million held by all African-American insurance companies in the United States 
during the same time period. So there was significant convincing to be done by the black press and the black business class. Now, part of that was, was, was assisted, part of that, that attempt to, to convince the black population was augmented and insisted by the white population itself. In the, after the turn of the century, segregation laws are intensified in Montgomery. In 1914, um, a city code reads, all persons or corporations who sell or otherwise dispose tickets, coupons, or cards for admission to any theater or any place of amusement in the city of Montgomery have, must have separate lines and places for the sale of tickets, coupons, or cards for white and colored persons. City ordinances also compelled theaters and other places of amusement to require whites and colored persons to form separate lines or groups when assembled. So you see, the, the, this, this racial caste system is solidifying in the city of Montgomery at the turn of the century, at the same time that, that the newspapers and the black business class is, are, are, is making this concerted effort to, to um, promote this idea of, a, of this black nationalist idea by black and, um, and interact with black business persons. Now, there's another of, of other elements used to, to, to forward these, these goals, and you can see them replete throughout the newspapers. Um, the black newspapers say, um, there, is not a colored shoe, there is not a shoe store where clerks, white clerks, will fit shoes on black, black people. Some people may be old enough to remember when black women or black men went to a store to buy shoes that they couldn't try the shoes on. They had to either know what size they wanted to wear. In some cases, if they were elite enough, they could take the shoes home, try them on, and bring back the pair that didn't fit. Or they would go into a store and, and, and in order not to, and not, in order so that hats wouldn't be contaminated, they have to wear stocking caps or, you know, to, to try on um, clothing. So the black press pointed out these discrepancies or pointed out these inadequate, um, these this discriminatory practice and registered its outrage. And you see this. Um, one issue of the Colored Alabamian says, um, is, is quoted as saying, why any respectable Negro will accept, and in this, in this case they're talking about theaters. Um, and let, me, let me just say an aside. The theaters also represented a, a stark place of segregation and, and humiliation in Montgomery. Um, so not only did these stores represent some, some problems, but um, Montgomery had several theaters. On Monroe Street, there was a, a, a white-owned theater that had, at the turn of the century, it allowed blacks to sit in the balcony, but they divided the balcony into two halves, one half for prostitutes and the other half for African Americans. Most theaters allowed black, and, and, and you, that seems a bit incredible, there was a time in Montgomery and throughout the South where prostitution was winked at, and there was a large segment of prostitutes who were visible to, you know, um, the, the average citizen. Um, and you see that addressed during the progressive era. But nevertheless, there were other types of, of problems that, are, that, are, that black folks had to deal with when frequenting the theater. Oftentimes, they had to wait until all the white patrons had left the theater before they were allowed to, to leave. So there was a number of slights that African Americans had to accept or deal with if they wanted to patronize white businesses. And so the black newspaper responded, why any respectable Negro would accept any such accommodation and degrade himself and disgrace his race to see any play on earth is a mystery to me. It goes on to say, in all the large southern cities, Negroes should have or should organize companies and build their own theaters or stay at home. According to the Al colored Alabamian, this pattern of discrimination already results in a great falling off um, here of late in the attendance of colored people at the theaters in Montgomery. Okay. You also see during the turn of the century another phenomenon where Whites who had previously patronized black clients or black businesses started, started to, the number of whites started to diminish. <clears throat> and so um, you start to see in the paper, it becomes newsworthy by the second de decade of the 20th century when you have a black 
um, business person who has white clientele. This, the most prolific example of this is in the barbering business. During the antebellum period and shortly thereafter, you had black barbers who, who serviced uh, almost an entirely all white clientele. Um, and, and built a lucrative trade on that. That starts to diminish after the turn of the century as you move into the 19-teens and 1920s. Okay. <clears throat> what you also see in these same papers, these same newspapers, are an appeal to the black elites in Montgomery, particularly the 20 or so black, top black businessmen, and they're identified by name. Um, Also an appeal to um, the 14 or so black professionals, and the medical doctors and dentists and the like. And that's, it's the city's most um, notable politician. When I say politicians, you still have black um, men serving in political roles in the Republican Party at the state or regional level, or national level. And so there were some black politicians after the turn of the century in that respect. Um, <clears throat> okay, but, but this... this, this Propaganda and this um, um, approach by the newspapers continues. The Color of Alabama in 1914 says, we blame colored businessmen. They should never stand by to see their mothers, their sisters, their wives humiliated in this way. Um, and they point to the, the potential of 53,000 African Americans in the city of Montgomery in 19, well, 1911 as, um, as a, the potential market. Okay. <clears throat> What you see in the aftermath is um, what you see in the aftermath is a proliferation of, 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 of black businesses that speak to all of these issues. So you see dry goods stores opening up, where, for instance, George Newstell opens up a store that provides shoes and for women, children, and men, and emphasizes that he's providing these shoes on a non-discriminatory basis, where his clerks are friendly and courteous. You see theaters open up in Montgomery. Eventually there's several theaters, the Carver Theater, the Ritz Theater, the Peking Theater, the State or the Art Theater in, in, in East Montgomery. So all of these theaters open up to provide African Americans with um, access to movies, access to, 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 to shows of, um, free of discrimination. African Americans have to be convinced that the business acumen or the business um, offerings of black businesses are just as good as that of whites. And so the paper has to convince black folks, for instance, that if you have a coal operator and he's delivering coal, that the coal is weighed at the same city scale and it's, it's just as good and weighs just as much as white coal does. And so there's, again, this attempt to overcome this idea of inferiority. Okay. Um, one example of, of this is, 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 is seen in the Colored Merchants Association. What black businesses had, had found, or black grocers had found, was that they could not buy on wholesale from white wholesalers, um, Sunday Dinner and others. And so it put, placed them at a disadvantage. They could only sell at a higher premium. Oftentimes they tried to overcome this by providing um, um, credit. However, what they decided to do was to organize amongst themselves. And so about 14 um, black grocers in the city of Montgomery co coordinate their efforts and, 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 and create a, a sort of a buying entity where they pool their resources. One person may, may drive to um, Atlanta or go to um, Br um, Selma and buy brooms or soap and they come back and they divide those materials up amongst them and they could sell them you know, at, at somewhat of a cheaper um, cost. The National Negro Business League understands what they're doing in Montgomery and, and, and creates this, the Colored Merchants Association. And, and in the Colored Merchants Association, they create a brand of black made and owned goods that are distributed to black owned stores. And so this is the, the, the National Negro Business League's way of trying to overcome some of the um, obstacles to black business development. And these CMA stores, I just had a list of streets that they were located on throughout Montgomery. Uh, and I just want to, well, I got five minutes. <laughs> so I just want to say that 
in, 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 in moving towards a close, that um, Monk, the walking Montgomery, or a, a late a turn of the century Montgomery, turn of the 20th century, 19th to 20th century Montgomery, um, was was de- organized spatially a bit different than we than we know of it today. And so you could see this um, Court Street creates one axis, okay, and um, Dexter Avenue created another axis. So this would be what, what, what I would define as Black East Montgomery. This is Black North Montgomery, and this is Black West Montgomery. And I say Black because I'm, I'm just particularly looking at the Black populations and, and, and the spatial representation of Montgomery. Now, a, in every section of the city, you see the development of um, Black businesses to address the needs of Black neighborhoods. But you, there is a concerted concentration of black businesses that parallel Dexter Avenue that, is, that, are, that are centered on Monroe Street. And I want to talk about the, the businesses in that section of the city. There's a number of streets that intersect Monroe Street. North Court Street is one of those streets. And I just listed a number of businesses that would have been located on North Court Street in 1915. And I look at some businesses in 1915, and I look at that same section in some respects in 1925. But you get to see there's a, there's a proliferation of grocers and barbers, um, cook shops and lunch shops and cafeterias. But there also are a number of um, of other types of undertakings, and this is just one example of that. North Lawrence Street also intersects um, Monroe Street, and you could see that there are you know, shoemaking businesses and shoe repair. Shoe repairs are pretty common businesses too. Again, John Fagan as a harness maker. I, Sydney and Oceana Grayson own a number of businesses on a number of different. Um, and number of different business clusters around the city. That this is their picture on the right hand side. This is uh, Sydney and Oceana Grayson, and they are probably the most um, important business couple in, in, in Montgomery. And um, <clears throat> and and so and so have property in a number of different locations and businesses in a number of different locations. But North Lawrence Street is, is certainly a critical street in this Black Business District. North Decatur Street, and there's, there's a whole number of eateries, again, in North Decatur Street, but there's also shoemakers and clothiers and, and grocers and um, these, a variety of cook shops and dressmakers and blacksmiths. And so you see this proliferation of businesses um, um, that, that could be found on North Court Street, both in 1915, and again, there's some changes, but additions in, 19, in 1925. But Monroe Street is the center of business activities for African Americans in Montgomery. And in 1917, the Emancipator newspaper refers to this section of Montgomery as Uptown. And there's, um, and, but, but critical to this section of Montgomery is, this, is, is the clientele or the, the individuals that come from um, the rural areas into Montgomery. Now, this is... This is important for a number of reasons, and, and the black business class realizes how important this um, rural population is and tries to accommodate that rural population in, in, in a variety of ways. One way they do is to create the community service center. So in 1917, they build a building that allows um, rural folks to come to Montgomery and, um, and it, it, to secure their, their, their belongings in locker rooms, to, um, to have drinking facilities, a lounge area, restrooms, a you know, snack bar. So it's a place for them to serve, sort of serve as a hub while they're in Montgomery um, taking care of business. Now, in 1918, there's the, oh, uh, Montgomery opens the Union Stockyards and, and becomes the Southeast's only terminal livestock market. And it's important for the, the, the trade in livestock. And so rural folks come to Montgomery to participate in, in, in trade their animals, sell their goods, buy goods. It's, it's just an economic center. And um, <clears throat> now one eyewitness who, who, who sort of talks about this, this environment in the 19-teens um, records her, her um, observations. It's a white eye, eyewitness, and she says that um, she recalls the sophisticated colored gentry 
that have always done business on Monroe Street, doctors and dentists. But the country Negroes sustained the rancorous life of the street for many years. Flim flam artists, pimps and panderers could be found among the many bawdy houses in this area. In, the, in this account, this white commenter describes the first and second block of Monroe Street and the first and second block of Court Street as clearly within the black business district. Okay, so um, while Monroe Street has, um, and this is the area we're talking about, um, this is uh, Monroe Street, right above Dexter Avenue, and you have um, these, these intersecting streets form a grid, then to some degree include parts of Commerce Street and even Coosa Street and the upper part of Tallapoosa Street, all in this, 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 this black business district known as Uptown. Um, I think I'm running out of time. I just want to wrap up my conversation by, by emphasizing a few things. One, that, that although we associate Booker T. Washington with this idea of entrepreneurial um, acumen and business relationships and, and, and agricultural pursuits, um, the idea for his National Negro Business League actually comes from W.E.B. Du Bois. And his emphasis on the newspaper and his emphasis on insurance, agent, uh, insurance companies and banking is also reflected in the research done by W.E.B. Du Bois. More importantly, the black business class, fueled by this ideology, this accommodationist ide ideology, promotes this idea of, promotes this idea of self-help and promotes this idea of sort of black nationalism in black community as they attempt to build, you know, a prosperous black world in a, in a somewhat hostile, larger, um, segregated southern environment. I think I've wrapped up <laughs> my comments. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. We have time for some questions. Uh, if you have a question for Dr. Robinson, please raise your hand and let us give you the microphone, then speak directly into the microphone. We do have people in the next uh, auditorium that would like to hear your questions. Thank you. Dr. Robinson, I know this is out of the time frame that you were speaking of, but would you want to say a word about Posey's parking lot? You know, I'm delighted to say to talk about Posey's parking lot. Um, the, the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture at, at Alabama State University is um, dedicating a, a marker uh, in honor of Posey, Posey um, Eddie Posey and his wife that operated a parking lot at the, really at the corner of um, McDonough and, and Monroe Street. And it, was, it, it serviced this black business district. Um, but more importantly, it was one of two major transportation hubs that, that, um, that serviced the Montgomery bus boycott in the 1950s. And so it, it, it was a critical link that allowed African Americans to continue to, um, to go to work and to go to school and to, and to live during the Montgomery bus boycott. And so um, the National Center at Alabama State University is honoring that by dedicating um, a marker at that location. <laughs> that is occurring on December the 1st at 11 o'clock. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Audrey. <laughs> Yes. Wonderful presentation. I'm just uh, just wonderful because many of us were living during that time, and especially uh, Reverend and Mrs. Gratz. We used to call what you're talking about uptown in the community. Mm -hmm. We called it dark town. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, and there's some real excellent primary sources. Uh, uh, Lloyd. Uh, oh shoot, Lloyd's. They own the Good Service Cab Company, uh, Howard, Lord Bernard, and he's still around. And he could talk about that because his, his folks had businesses in what we call dark town. And, let, uh, let, me, let me speak to that just quickly. We, um, at, at Alabama State, I, mean, I, I am the university archivist. One of the things that we're doing is, is, is putting together an a oral history series. And we, we interviewed the Howard brothers 
And they have an intriguing story. And I just want to say it's just a bit of it, and you can get a sense of, of this. That, and it, it, it dates back to their grandfather. He had worked at, um, he had worked at a white business interest and was fired. He felt unfairly and, and swore to himself that he would never work for white people again. And to, to, until today, you know, there are a number of businesses. I think one of the, the family now owns a, a um, they supply Hyundai. And, and so, and so they, they moved up the business chain, but Howard's hairstylist and is, is part of that family. And so they created uh, generations of businessmen, you know, from that one incident, you know, and, and again, um, near the turn of the century. That, was, that relates to my question. Could you talk about how long these continued and how they, I mean, just kind of maybe an overview of how they evolved on after the uh, 20s? Oh, the, 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 the district, the business districts um, persisted. And one of the reasons I, and that points to why I started looking at black businesses in the first place. And it really was when I got to Montgomery, Alabama, as a student at Alabama State as a freshman, I saw um, a black business district that looked like a shell of a district and wanted to know why, what happened. And um, desegregation happened. You know, desegregation had um, immense positive um, attributes for the community as a, as a whole and black people specifically in terms of opportunity to new un, 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 unprecedented job opportunities and ability to, to access um, accommodations that heretofore were, were closed. Um, and just the, uh, the ability to become integral parts of the, of the, the fabric of this nation. I mean, Montgomery is important because it, it stands at the center of this movement to, to desegregate and, and to jettison um, racial classifications as a justification for discrimination and segregation. But on the other hand, um, African Americans in Montgomery who, who had struggled so mightily to, to slay the white supremacy giant and, and to participate in this society in ways that, that were not dependent on their color, took advantage of being able to eat at um, the lamplight or a, a, a previously, an a institution or a facility that was previously off limits to them. Took advantage of opportunities to stay, instead of, instead of at the Benmore Hotel, to stay at the Holiday Inn. And so they did this in mass to, to, to test and to, and, to, and to experience the fruits of the civil rights movement. But, but that test had a, had a residual or had an unintended consequence, and it almost decimated the black business class in Montgomery. Um, and so, and, and, and there's other factors that come into play. But, of course, or urban renewal, the interstate system. There, was, there were a number of factors that changed the dynamic of community, but, but, but desegregation had a, had a critical impact on, on that. The, the black business class had almost a captive market um, in, in a segregated world, and you had the close proximity of the black intellectuals, the black elite, the black business class, in very close proximity with the black underclass and the black working class. And there was a symbiotic relationship in that as problems and needs arose in the black community, you had a class of folks who were in the position to address them and, and benefit from addressing them. And so there was a, in, in desegregation, you had a spatial divide um, in, in, in amongst the black classes that I think diminished the ability to, to address those, those issues in, in significant ways. We have time for one more question, Dr. Robinson. Thank you for your presentation. <clears throat> and this question is somewhat outside of the scope of your time frame, okay. but I'm curious to know, when did the black newspapers disappear and what caused their demise here in Montgomery? Well, actually, I don't think they've disappeared. There, there are still black newspapers. Um, and. The black newspapers, even when they were at, in their heyday, they were short-lived typically. They were, and, and, and black people typically read them in tandem with other papers, major white dailies. Um, black newspapers were extremely critical in communicating to black community. You had, 
and, and there was a d different type of dynamic. You, you had black newspapers that were local, but you also had a series of black newspapers that, that were distributed at, on a national level. And um, the Chicago Defender, the, the, the Cleveland Calling Post, uh, uh, the Pittsburgh Courier. And, and a lot of these papers were distributed via the tr train network. Pullman Porters would distribute these newspapers as they traveled on their routes. And so you had um, stringers or stories that would emanate in Montgomery and that would be included in a Montgomery section in the Pittsburgh Carrier or the um, uh, Miss Jackson, Mississippi section in the Pittsburgh Carrier. So these were truly black newspapers um, of, a, of a national scope. Again, integration had a significant impact, but I, don't say it, I wouldn't say it killed the black paper, but it crippled it. And so, but there are still black papers. Um, I want to say the Montgomery Tuskegee Times is still being, um, and, and, and so, and, and looking at these black, to do research on black, the black population in, in, in African American history would be extremely difficult without the black press. And, and, and you read the, an account in the black press and the same account in the white press, and it's just interesting how stark the difference is. Um, so, and then, and then you have to use other resources to try to navigate the truth uh, or approximate the truth. But, um, but I would say that black news, newspaper still is breathing and alive. Um. Thank you, Dr. Robinson.